This is a lecture for my professional responsibility class, and we're going to be talking about conflicts of interest. And specifically, under Rule 1.7, um, we're going to be talking about um, uh, conflicts that can arise after the representation begins. Okay, um, so comment uh, five starts a section of uh, the comments to rule 1.7 about what happens when a conflict arises after the representation. And so I want you to um, think about this for just a moment. So remember in a previous video, in the previous comments to 1.7, it set forth that your duty as a lawyer is not only to um, not represent clients with a conflict of interest, not try to, um, uh, to create the conflict but, or, or get yourself in that situation, but the firms, law firms and law practices have a duty to screen for conflicts. This needs to be part of your initial consultation with a client is to get some information so that you can check and decline the representation if you have a conflict. And so the, the very fact that you're not screening for conflicts it is a violation um, of the ethical rules if you're not. Now, sometimes you are screening for conflicts of interest. You're doing your due diligence, you're investigating, you're asking lots of questions, um, you've asked lots of questions of all your other clients, you're using very sophisticated software to track all of the little things that can go wrong and create a conflict, but you could still have a conflict that arises after the representation is already underway. And that's what we're going to be talking about, and that's what comment five is talking about. And what happens is you may actually have to withdraw from the representation. So let's look at comment, uh, comment five. Unforeseeable developments, such as changes in corporate and other organizational affiliations, or the addition or, uh, or realignment of parties in litigation might create conflicts in the midst of a representation. And then here's the classic example that you, you've got to just have in your head. Well, what are we talking about? As when a company sued by the lawyer on behalf of one client is bought by another client represented by the lawyer in an unrelated matter. And so I want you to think for a, a moment, uh, kind of picture that you are doing legal work, uh, let's say for Acme Corporation um, or XYZ Corporation. And, um, and then another client comes to you and they, they say, I want to sue this, um, uh, uh, I want to uh, I want to sue a company uh, um, that is a uh, and you say who do you want to sue and fortunately you've never heard of them right so you're screening for conflicts a new client comes and they say I want to sue uh, this brand new co corporation that has started that has launched um, and uh, and you do your conflicts check and you have no relationship with that other party so you decide to go ahead and the problem is that once you're underway this other corporation, XYZ Corporation or conglomerate corporation buys that person, that company that you're suing or acquires it. Um, and, and so now we have a conflict of, uh, of interest that um, can be very significant. And, um, and that's what we're talking about. So corporate mergers and um, it, it says changes in corporate and other organizational affiliations. This can also happen for example, if you have, let's say, a standalone law school that, um, uh, that you were uh, suing and you were doing unrelated legal work for another major university, and let's say that law school merge, that university acquires that law, that standalone law school or that standalone paralegal school or something like that, and that, that you had litigation against. And so now you have a conflict of interest. Now, depending on the circumstances, the lawyer may have the option to withdraw from one of the representations in order to avoid the conflict. Um, and um, in a lot of cases, if you have a case underway before court, you're probably going to have to seek court approval and uh, to withdraw from uh, representation and take steps to minimize the harm to the clients. And, I, and so this is, by the way, courts almost always um, will approve uh, you to withdraw as counsel, um, I mean, almost for any reason, but uh, they do have the right to say no, 
and you do have to ask permission, seek leave, and, and normally it's just as simple as filing a form uh, with the court saying, I'm withdrawing as, as counsel, this client of mine is getting um, another lawyer. I don't wanna be the attorney of record anymore. Um, and so, but keep that in mind. If you have a duty to decline representation, when you screen, when you catch the conflict beforehand, the corresponding duty, if a conflict arises once representation is underway, is that you have to withdraw from representation and send them to another lawyer. Um, and so uh, simultaneous representation of clients can, involved in different lawsuits can give rise to a conflict if the suits involve unrelated matters. And so here's a couple examples. You don't need to remember these examples. I'm just using them for purposes of illustration. One is a Texas case from the Eastern District uh, in the federal courts in Texas from 2007. And so there was a law firm that was simultaneously prosecuting a patent infringement case for one client and representing a potential infringer on other matters. And so, uh, so I just want you to think about this. You have someone who is, um, who claims that they own the patent to something and they come to you and ask you, I want you to go sue this patent infringer and you're doing that. And then another client who you represent, not about that product at all, you just do other legal work for them, is also arguably making that same, uh, the same copies of the same product. Um, and, and so if you win for one client, it will be, um, uh, you will essentially establish legally that uh, for the, in the one case that they are the patent owner, um, the, the, the appropriate patent owner. And that means that now all of a sudden they have a, a much more for sure claim against other potential infringers. Uh, we actually have a surprising number of these types of um, like arise after the fact, uh, conflicts of interest come up in intellectual property cases where you're representing one company and who's either the infringer or the, the person who claims to be the patent holder. But if you either establish the ownership of the patent or that somebody doesn't own the patent, it can have a lot of consequences for everybody else in the market who may also have been arguably um, uh, infringing on that patent. And, um, and so the other example I have here is from 2006 in the Northern District of Illinois. Again, a law firm was um, rendering a non-infringement opinion for one client, um, and um, the, but the patent was actually owned by another client. And this might not seem like an obvious conflict uh, to you, but let's say you have a pharmaceutical company that you represent and they own the patent to uh, a useful drug. And I'll give an example, let's say, right, as I'm making these videos, there's a number of companies racing to develop a, co a vaccine for the coronavirus and um, uh, for COVID-19. And so let's say a few companies do come up with vaccines and you represent one of those companies uh, who owns a vaccine and uh, like the patent, I'm sorry, to, to one of the vaccines um, in, in future years. And then another company comes along and they've made some slight variations on the formula, but they're, they're also making a, a vaccine that's very similar to your other client's vaccine. But it's also a little different and maybe they use a little different process to make it or they, the proportions of ingredients uh, are different or in their case, they added a special sauce, um, who knows, uh, but they, uh, they come to you and, and basically they say, we would like you to analyze this as a patent lawyer and tell us if this infringes on this other company's uh, patent for this vaccine. And you write it up and you decide, you know what, I don't think it does. I don't think it's close enough. And so maybe you think, well, this doesn't hurt these other people because they weren't infringing, in, in your opinion, on their patent. So no harm, no foul, right? Well, not exactly. Because if maybe if they had gone to another lawyer, that lawyer would have said, actually, I think it does. And your client who owns the patent would have had an infringement claim. In other words, um, you have an kind of an incentive um, a, a maybe a skewed incentive to reach a certain uh, conclusion for this client um, and your other client is going to be frustrated by that. So keep that in mind. Um, so that's enough for this video talking about clients, uh, uh, conflicts that can arise after the fact.